okay so hello everyone i hope everyone is here and everyone is doing great so today we'll be learning about the fourth unit uh, from the android basics with compose course uh, i hope everyone is ready for this session so let's get started now so presenting and welcome again to this compose camp session 4 we're we're excited to have you here st starting your journey as being a, becoming an android developer and this program again is brought to you by the GDSC club uh, in collaboration with uh, to, in to get total together five more clubs including colleges like AISSMS, AISSMS IT, Trinity COE and NBN Siagad. So thank you for all our, our collaborators. Now let's get started towards the session. So before we start, let me introduce myself. So I am Siddesh Kukade. I am uh, a third year IT student and also an application expert at GDSC club PVGCOAT. So uh, yeah, that's about me. Uh, if you want to know, learn more about me, uh, you can just type on g.dev slash Siddesh Kukade. So let's try doing that. So you can see uh, my profile, my badges, and you can get to know, learn more about me, and you can uh, get my links also here. So yeah, I think that was about that, that was about it. Uh, so let's finally we'll get started. Okay, so sorry for the interruptions. Now we'll get finally started. So let's get started with today's session. So yeah, again, compose camp. Okay, so prerequisites. Uh, these are not important or mandatory or something like that. But I wish you to have completed with these things. I wish you to have completed with our unit one, unit two, and unit three of our compose camp sessions, so that you'll understand these things in a better way. Okay. So that was about that. Moving up next, what do we have today in this session? So today we we are going to learn learning about the app architecture and how to use the components like view models, handling the UI state and state flow to build a more complex app, to organize the code, to test the code and to maintain among multiple developers. So in this one in this particular point you will be learning about the, all of the developer related things and all of the uh, things that you're going to be needing to make your developer life more efficient okay uh, after that we'll be learning about navigation in jetpack so uh, we'll learn about how we can use navigation to build more complex apps uh, with more screens and how to navigate and pass data between those screens uh, with different composable components in this one and then finally guys we're going to be focusing on adapting for different screen sizes so in this uh, one, what you will be learning is, you will learn how to uh, adapt your app according to the screen sizes, uh, provide a better user experience and as well as how you can test our user interface, whether it is being adapted or not. And again, uh, before, uh, yeah, so again one more point here, so there is a difference between adaptive and responsive, okay. So we'll, uh, also, we'll also be covering that one in the session as well. So with that said, uh, let's finally move on. So yeah, again, uh, this one is being taken uh, from the Android Basics with Compose course uh, provided by developer.google.com website. So you can refer to that as well if you need for further reference. Or if any changes happen in the future, you can refer to them here as well. Okay. So yeah, I think that was about it. And you can also do the Google search about Android Basics with Compose and you'll find this course. Again guys, if you have any doubt, anything, you know, anything, you, if you feel it is too simple or too difficult, just feel free to ask them. Just feel free to ask your doubts in the comment section. I am always active in the comments, so I will be replying very as soon as they come on the comment section. Again guys, if you have any doubts, make sure to drop them. Just don't shy, okay? Finally guys, we are going to get started with our first point, which was app architecture. So before starting with the architecture, let's see why do we need one or let's see why do we need the component life cycle which we'll be covering here so let's talk about some of the current problems that we are, we are facing with our app that we've created throughout this series okay 
so now i hope you've created something uh, app uh, by following the previous series so let's see so the some problems occurs like device configuration do change you know sometimes uh, your app is not installed on only a specific type of devices a device can be very old it can be very new it can have a multi, it can have a foldable screen or it can have a bigger screen or it may not be able to have like a large screen to fit your entire user interface in that so that problems can happen in the devices sometimes uh, some devices don't have like things like uh, some devices like speaker problems and anything like that so we also need to handle such things as well the second point second point is mobile devices are a resource constraint so see if your application is taking too much space or too much memory while it is running uh, it is not good for that mobile devices to run that application for a longer time uh, so for example if you minimize your application and if uh, and user opens it again if your application is using too, taking too much resources what the your operating system of the phone will do is it will just close that app and reopen it again so what that does is that creates a bad user experience as the state of the application is not maintained so it creates problems and it's not uh, better for the user experience here then we have app should be able to start from the point that it has been closed so again the same point that we were talking about whenever we minimize the app it should come back to that point that we've left it okay so that is important for uh, improving the user experience and that is the current problem that we are facing here okay so we also see uh, how we can make our uh, app more resource efficient and everything so okay uh, with that said guys uh, let me know if you have any doubts on the comments okay no problem no uh, no problem in that one so let us move forward okay so before i tell you the life cycle i just want to uh, make sure everything is know what is going on so again kotlin guys uh, let's see uh, how the program is being started in kotlin as well as in android app using the compose app, uh, using the compose definitely so uh, as we all know in the kotlin app the main function the main function starts as a uh, works as a starting point of the program and then the entire program is uh, executed by following with the main functions okay so the the code of the main function is executed very first in the program so that was about the kotlin and in the android app as we all know the main activity acts like a main function in the android you have to you have to override <coughs> you have to override this on create method uh, which will be which will be used to create the uh, user interface on the uh, on your mobile phone okay so i hope um, you have got how the start of the execution happens in both kotlin and in android okay again if you have doubts make sure to drop them on the comments let's move on so here we have activity life cycle so activity okay so activity life cycle here so before learning about the life cycle let's talk about what is activity here so activity can be anything it can be a button or an entire screen or a, you know a search bar or a text component it can be any component okay a component or a group of component is called as activity here okay i hope you understood that now let us see uh, how the li why and how the life cycle is uh, how the life cycle works basically so uh, before we start with this complex one let's start with a simple one so i hope everyone knows how a butterfly grows from it becoming a caterpillar then it you know uh, it goes in this process and then it becomes a blood of butterfly so the you know uh, first of all this is it's the butterfly's birth stage then the butterfly slowly grows and it eats food and it gets in the sunlight gets water and everything so proper resources are provided to it then it becomes a caterpillar and when it becomes a caterpillar and it uh, and it be, you know it it becomes mature enough and uh, then then what it does is it, it climbs on a tree or a branch and it sticks on itself and it goes in the process of uh, i think it's called as hibernation but what it does is it converts itself into a beautiful butterfly and after you know uh, after everything it just uh, you know it just goes in it goes in, in in peace okay so i hope you uh, understood this butterfly life cycle and hope you are already familiar with that so just like that guys we also have a life cycle in uh, components of our application okay the components are like just like first they are initialized then they are created and then they are started and then it, they might get resumed and might get again started and uh, after all these phases they might go back in these stages and get destroyed 
So just like the caterpillar, our uh, component also goes in all of these stages that we discussed here. Okay. So uh, yeah. So let's take an example here. Okay. So. Okay, so this is how the life cycle activity work, activity life cycle is working. So let's start here. <coughs> let's say uh, a button is uh, a button has to be created and it has to be shown on your application. So what is the first process of it? First of all, it will be created by this by the compiler. Okay, it will be created and it will be go first in the initialized state. Okay, it will be initialized and then uh, it will use the on create method to create itself on the application. So then. It will go. Uh, you have to use on create method to create that. Okay, uh, yeah. So I think you can remember this method from right here. This is the on create method that we were talking about, and this works for converting a component in the starting state of the activity life cycle. So this is how the on create works. And once your application is in a created state, that means it is created, but it is not rendered or not shown in your Android application. It might be hidden, or it is just not rendered. Okay. So to render it on the screen, you have to use methods like on start or on restart. So there's a there's a star on the on restart because when you are restarting the application on and then and only then this method is executed. But when you are starting the when the component is getting uh, rendered on the screen for the very first time, then then and only uh, this on start method will run. Okay. So the application then goes on the started state. So again, what is the meaning of started state? So started state just means that your uh, your the button that you were talking about will be uh, rendered on the screen of the applications. Okay, it might be shown to the user or it might not be shown to user or it it may not be clicked by the user. So let's say when the user clicks on that button, which means the activity has the focus. Okay, which means which means the the user is focusing on that button. Which means the user is clicking on that button basically. So then it goes from the started state to this resumed state that means the application is resumed at the sorry the widget is resumed and it is being used by the user so when it loses focus or when say when, let's say when the user quickly clicks anywhere on the screen besides from that button then it goes back again in the uh, started state so how does this happens uh, so yeah these things happen and to to run for and for that things the on resume and on pause methods are used okay so again, uh, uh, and after that, uh, when it is started, and if let's say the application doesn't needs it, so it will then it will then stop this component, and it will become uh, in it will go in the created state again, and and we can either choose to destroy that component, and it will be destroyed, and it will be gone from that uh, application. Okay, so this is how it works. Make sure let's do a recap here. So first of all, the button is initialized by the program, and then it is created. And the on create method is used while it is being created. We'll talk about why are we are using this method in a bit. So after it is created, it then goes in the started state where it is rendered on the screen. Okay, you can see this activity is visible thing here. So it means it is rendered on the mobile screen. So after that, it is resumed. Okay, resumed means it is being used by the user. It has the focus from the user. The button is clicked. That means the user has focused on the button. Okay. And after the work is done, user clicks away. Then it goes back in the started state, and when the 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 operation of the button is completed, then it then it goes back in the created state, and then finally it goes back in the destroyed state. Okay, so this is how it comes alive and is just just gets destroyed finally. So again, you'll ask, so why do we have these methods uh, lying around in the, each of these stages? So let's say suppose to make uh, your application more uh, to more efficient or you know, if you want to uh, implement something complex here, like uh, uh, freeing the resources or locking the resources taken from an API or a what you can call that, I'll say a two-way connection. So you can execute the that code on these methods. Let's say I want to execute a specific code whenever the application is resumed. So what I'll do is I'll use this method. I'll write my code, and uh, yeah, then the code will definitely execute it whenever the application is resumed. Let's say I want to free some of the system resources whenever the uh, whenever the activity is destroyed. So what I'll do is I'll write some code using this on destroy method, and the code will be executed. 
just like I want it to. So again, just a quick note here. If you want to use these methods, make sure to override them from the component activity. Okay? You just cannot say function on create and it will not work. Okay? You have to uh, use this component activity, inherit from that, and use the override keyword. Okay? I hope you got that one. So I hope you clear with this diagram, guys. It was very important. I hope you are clear with everything. If you again have any doubts, feel free to ask them in the comments. I'm very free and very uh, ready to ask answer your doubts. Okay? No problem. So, okay, now we are moving ahead to using loggers. So, loggers are basically a logging to the application, which means you use console log in your browser, just like that logger works. So, logging means logging a variable or something, you know, it's just like printing the output in of your application, okay. So, we'll see how we can log out uh, values to the application using the tags that are provided in the compose, okay. So to view this one, what we have to do is we have to take this uh, URL. So let me just give a second. Yeah, so we'll take this URL and go on your browser and clear, insert this URL. Okay. The page will be appeared. Okay, there we have the page. You can see there is more information on the life cycle and all. So uh, yeah, we were talking about that tag. Okay. So okay. So okay. So if you want to log anything ever in your uh, program, okay, what is logging again? I'll tell you. So this is the console of my browser, okay. So just like that, uh, there can be uh, your program application as well. So if you want to log something like a variable or something, I can use it with console log. Uh, if you guys familiar with this one, you'll understand the this one is very easily. So we are just logging the values using this uh, log log class okay so what we are doing here is first of all before explaining it let's see so first to log the values on the uh, on the console what you need to do here is we have to create a const value which is a constant variable named as tag okay so the tag should have what tag do you want so we'll discuss more about what is this tag is about in a bit then what you need to do is you need to use this log class you need to import this class it will be auto imported by your editor no problem on that you have to do dot, dot d on that so which is d is a method to do the logging you have to do uh, you have to add the brackets and add this tag variable and after that you can use the string to print your data okay and again if you want to import this log you can import using import android.util.log or if you can just uh, you know uh, Control space bar on that and it will be auto imported by your editor. So after doing that, what you need to do is you have to run your program and you have to go on the lock cat option of the program. And after going on that option, you will see the tag that is being used here. Okay. So the tag will help you to you know uh, to to categorize the your logs. Okay. So you can see on create called is right here and the tag is right here. So you can see uh, let me show you that we had the tag which is which was named as main activity uh, which is right here and we can see the log as well that we have using before so just like that okay so that was about the uh, the tag and the main activity uh, the tag and logging in the compose so i hope you got that one if you have any doubts again drop them in the comments below let's continue here and let's see uh, the configuration changes what happens when device configuration changes and how we can uh, handle that things okay so uh, configuration changes means the properties of devices are being changed here so what do you mean by the properties of devices are being changed like how it can be changed so uh, it can change when the device is rotated horizontally or vertically then the width and height of the devices change and when it changes guys what happens is it uh, as we learned previously in the life cycle so whenever your device is rotated it calls the on destroyed method so all of your components are destroyed and they are rendered again on the screen okay so there is a re-rendering that is happening that is uh, that is so far that you cannot feel it but it is there okay so keep in mind about that so what it happens is if you are using a, so what the problem with this is the problem is as data loss so what do you mean by data loss uh, how how it can be data loss when just rotating the device as we talked again uh, whenever we rotate this phone uh, as an in, as an, in a horizontal uh, direction so it will call the on destroy methods on everything okay on every activities you can see the desert, desert photo here 
this uh, nav bar or this header or this value everything will be destroyed and re-rendered again on the screen so so let's say this is a 55 dollar value this will also be gone and become zero so how we can uh, you know uh, persist this value or how we can store this value you can use it using a remember savable uh, method to save the values so how we can use it again you have to use variable revenue and you have to say using buy keyword you have to say buy remember and create a state out of it so if you have used uh, react or something like that uh, it is similar to using use state hook in react okay we are just maintaining the state of the application and we are also specifying it is mutable state of zero so this is we are specifying that this state can be mutated and it is contained the initialized value as zero and again we are printing uh, this image id which is right here and we are, you can see we are updating it so this is an updater function as well so you can update uh, the value by providing it in the brackets okay so just like the use state hook in react this is, is this is how it's working finally guys after all of that we are finally moving towards the app architecture so what do you mean by app architecture so app architecture means uh, a way of architecting the app you know we architect buildings or we create like uh, cars or something we need to architect them first okay so the quality of the building or the car is dependent upon how it is architected okay so that is very important so just like that okay quality of apple application is depends on how well it is architected and what do we mean by uh, how well it is architected so as you can see a well architecture app is an, an is an app which is easier to which is easier to test make robust expand and team develop so what what does what does this mean so a well architecture app is an app that is easier to test so the app should be testable there should be tests for everything and making sure that the app are complying and uh, passing all of the test cases okay so that is uh, a uh, property of a well architectured app then it is robust the code should not be <coughs> easily exploitable it should be strong enough to hold for uh, even if it is in a you know in a cyber attack or something you know uh, ddos attack or something like that so it, it, it should be able to handle that or if the device's performance is too low if you are using uh, too, too le something like a legacy phone so it should work on that situations as well or if device is in running on constraints and there are multiple applications open so our application should try its best to maintain the state and to run in a good condition okay that is important uh, there can be net network problems or storage problems or uh, device internal errors so our application should be robust enough to handle such problems so that is the basic meaning of robustness <clears throat> then finally expand so what do we mean by expand here uh, let me just check if i'm still recording yeah so what do we mean by expand here you know devices size changes and not everyone is having the same device with them so different people have different devices and same applications are installed in them so the problem here is that sometimes the devices can be too big or too small to ma uh, to maintain the ui and sometimes it is not suitable to use the same user interface in every single size of the devices so let's say if you are using a foldable device or if you are using a tablet so that ui should be different from the the base ui that was being used on a simple mobile application which has which was having a rectangular screen so i hope you got the meaning of expand here then finally team develop so your app should be uh, the code of the app should be understandable it should be easier enough and it should be well documented and commented so that it can be better used by the teams okay so that uh, everyone in the team can understand the code it should be organized as well the components and the styles and the test files and you know the ci cd checks the environmental set of files everything should be organized it should be documented and it should be clean okay by mean of clean it should be uh, easier for everyone to understand what is going on and for new developers that are coming in your team they should be uh, they they should be uh, it should be easier for them to cope up with your uh, development of this app so i hope you got that points if you have any doubts drop them on the comments below so finally need for separation of concern so what is separation of concern okay again guys when you are developing a, an application seriously there are a lot of problems there are a lot of things that we need to be concerned about there are problems with user interfaces there are problems with data handling there are problems with networking logic user inter uh, again user interface again and things like that security again 
you know to we need to handle with a lot of things so uh, to handle them in your app there should be a well way to handle the codes okay there should be a well way to handle the user interface and there should be a well structured manner to handle the user interface and the logic of the app so uh, do we have any solutions for that if you guys can think of about any solutions be sure to drop them on the comments below or you just can uh, comment like i don't know i am still thinking or something like that you know to keep the keep it a more interactive now finally separation of concern so again so solution of everything is this separation of concern so what do we have in the separation of concern these were all the concerns and let's see how we can separate them okay let's move on so this is the separation of concern uh, which uh, so which basically tells what we'll talk about this later so which the separation of concern it basically tells what it tells that we have to break down uh, we have to use the work breakdown structure so how we can use this structure so let's say this is our project what we need to do is we need to divide the task while developing it okay so let's say my project is about creating a facebook clone or something like that i need to divide the task okay first of all i'll create the login page then i'll create the sign up page then i'll create the dashboard again for these tasks i need to uh, divide them more in the sub tasks so let's say for the login page i need to, to create a login ui and just like that we need to uh, put them on the sub task and then finally putting this sub task in a work stages so for creating this user interface i need to write html files css files something like that so i'm just giving a, again a, 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 an example here okay i hope you understand this so encapsulation helps to enforce modularity again so uh, this uh, architecture provides encapsulation meaning of encapsulation is that this code or this logic is separated from other code okay so that uh, the concerns are separated so that each uh, uh, let's say if you assign this work to three developers they can work on each features so they don't have to worry about what other people is doing with their code so you know it will it won't create uh, problems like ambiguity or something like that okay so it is basically known as so breaking the the structure uh, bre breaking the our project in the sub task is basically known as modularity so modularity helps in testing making the code robust again what we've talked about what is robust previously in brief uh, helping to expand the application and yeah definitely this one is very helpful making the team uh, making able making sure that the team is uh, developing the application in a smooth and efficient manner because at the end of the day guys when you are creating an application the developer time is the thing that cost you the most so let's see how the separation of concern is being implemented in the compose framework so just like that uh, we have the unidirectional data flow uh, so we break our application in two layers the first one is data layer and the second one is user interface layer so what we are doing here is uh, the data layer is responsible for fetching the data managing the data and everything is that, that is data related like storing it in a mobile database or something like that so all of that is handled by the this data layer and the ui layer is basically responsible for showing the user interface correctly and in a in an consistent and efficient manner okay so basically what happens is a ui layer is in the user interface it sends event whenever a user clicks on a button or it uh, adds values in 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 inputs or something like that it sends those event uh, the data layer records those event and it stores the things that are happening let's say i've clicked on a button it will send that you uh, sudesh has clicked on a button so it will store that and it will provide the the accordingly the the process the data and it will provide the according output to the ui layer again to show it on the screen okay so that was about that so that was about that uh, let's see it in example let's say there, there is a contact app and we are using the user interface to list of displaying our contacts in our mobile phone and the data layer is being used for storing the contact data and managing it so let's say we click on a list it will send the event to this data layer and the data layer will send proper data back again to this ui layer i hope you got that let's move on to the testing so let us see how we can test our android app let us see how we can set up our test using the jnet framework so in this one we are going to learn about how you going to test your application with j unit framework so j unit is a framework for use for mainly used for testing created in developed in java language it is also compatible with uh, to, for being used in kotlin so to use the framework what you need to you just need to do a simple change in your uh, build.gradle file of your project existing project so you, you need to add this line here which is android uh, life android dot life cycle dot uh, colon life cycle dash view model compose colon 2.5.0 
Okay, so that's how you can set up your te test for your application for being test using for testing. So uh, if you uh, there is a, an, another way to do it as well. Uh, you need to, in the same Gradle file you need to find for dependencies and you need to add test implementation. J unit J unit 4.13.2. This line of code that you need to add here. Okay. So uh, why we doing uh, why, why I'm showing this you these two ways to do it. So the reason behind is this okay so using this video what will happen is when you are building your application and delivering it to the user your code for the testing will also get built up for that which is very unnecessary and not required to do it so by using this test implementation here your code will only be used for whether it, it, when it is in the development phase and where application is packaged up and ready to be deployed on app store or play store then this test code will be removed from your application making it more uh, more uh, reducing its size and making it more performance in efficient so there's an example of testing so to test anything what you need to do is uh, you can create a class you can test in the same class you need to add this at the rate test keyword here so and you need to uh, then we can easily uh, add up our function name that is a very long function name right right here so this entire thing is a function name and you can test anything by checking its values okay more on that on the course guys so yeah We'll here in this one we'll taking the overview of how things are working again if you're facing any doubts here making sure that uh, something is not being explained correctly so feel free to uh, drop it in the comments finally uh, so this was uh, the basic overview of how we can run the test let's see how we can execute the tests so what you need to do is when you are in a test file when you return your code so you need to right click on that you need to find uh, find it on the path of the Android studio you need to right click on that file you will get this menu and in this menu you need to find run game uh, sorry you need to find the option which is a run game model with coverage okay so what this does is it runs the, your code and it tests it and it provides the code coverage for it as well so again what is code coverage whenever we are testing your application uh, the coverage is that how many lines of code have you covered in your tests Let's say I have like 1000 line of code and if I have write written test for like 300 line of code then the test coverage will become 30% and the line of code that is covered will become like 300. Okay, so that is what a line of code and coverage is. Uh, you'll, after clicking on that you will get the, you'll get whether the tests are failed or whether they are successful. Okay, so you will get those messages. Let's move on to the navigation. So yeah, we are moving a bit fast here due to our time constraints. So we'll make sure everything is being covered here. So in this one, uh, yeah. So in this session, we are not focusing more on the code. We are just focusing on building the logic because this session is a bit complex and it may take uh, too much time for me to explain you the things that you can learn at your own pace uh, after the session while referring to this uh, uh, to this course by Google. Okay. So you need you you, you just need to and uh, you know you, you just need to here. To clear your to basics to clear your theory language about this and the practical is you can perform later on so what is navigation I'll show it with an example so yeah so as you can see there there can be single screen app that you can create or there can be uh, so one single app that is having multiple screen that you can operate by clicking on buttons so as you can see how it is being uh, changed here so when you are creating apps that are uh, these type of com complex applications so what you need to do is uh, you need to add some special components to make such apps so what will be these components and how we can make them is what we are going to talk about it them right now so let's see this i'll stop the video yeah so uh okay so navigating components uh, components with compose uh, to navigate the components with compose we need four things we need to get uh, we need to understand four things before we can uh, use the navigation components so we need to understand what is the destination what is meaning of nav host what is uh, routes or what are routes and what is a nav controller and how we can utilize them okay so destination let's talk about destination so the destination is so uh, destination is uh, the word is actually a bit self contradictory here so destination is actually the starting point here not the la ending point of an application so if you are using multiple screen first of all you need to uh, explain you need to uh, set up your destination which means the initial point of where you are going to start your navigation so let's say our app has these three screens which are a b and c so i need to set the destination as a 
to set it as the first screen and then we can navigate to these more screens as we uh, in the in the further using the further component that we will going to be uh, will will be uh, looking at so navigation uh, yeah so navigation routes and nav controller so what are routes routes are basically the ways okay as you can see the arrows are going in so these are routes like how you are routing it like how it should go from this screen to that screen and uh, does it uh, come between any more screens while going on that path so that we are focusing uh, using this route so routes are basically the roads or the pathways for uh, traversing the screens okay and nav controller is a class or you can call it as a object is a class that is being used to uh, to you uh, to execute these paths okay so to go from one path to another path we have the nav controller dot navigate button a uh, navigate function sorry you can use them and yeah so again what is back stack okay so when you are going from one screen to another another to one more what actually happens here is the application store uh, when you are pressing the back button like how the application uh, will, you will taken back to let's say i clicked uh, i initially got on the screen a then i moved to screen b and then i moved to screen c so what happened here is that uh, in a in a back stack this back stack is actually a stack data structure i hope everyone is familiar with what is a stack data structure if you have any doubts about stack you can drop them on the comments okay so whenever moving from this screen to this the the state will be recorded here in the stack so let's say i move from a to b then it will, the a will go in the stack and keeping a record that a has been inserted here and then from b to c if the b will go in the stack and calling that b has been inserted and finally the c also will go in the stack uh, in the top of the stack and the element that is in the top of the stack means that it is currently active so when i press back button this element will be deleted and will go to the previous element which is b so we have found b so we'll render the b as the user presses the back button if user presses the back button again it will go to the a and if user presses back button here again it will close the application okay this is how the back stack works finally uh, there is a uh, example here which is using nav controller dot navigate so you can see if there is a cupcake example here uh, cl after clicking on these buttons to uh, choose a flavor or something you get the directed to the separate screen for that and you can set our uh, flavors here and then after clicking on uh, the next button you will get to another screen which said to to choose a pick up date and after clicking next again you finally go to the order summary and you can send order okay so this is how the example is now finally so that was about the navigation guys i hope your concept is cleared with navigation if you have any doubts again i'm um, uh, be make sure to drop them in the comments okay fine so finally moving on to the last point which is adapting for different screen sizes so again guys uh making an application production ready means that it needs to be uh, able to stand out and it needs to be able to uh, adapt to screen sizes okay so what is meaning of adapting to screen sizes so adapting means let's say if your application is, is showing a specific ui on one screen the, then it should, uh, for the second screen it should, it should it should show a different ui okay it should adapt to its size it should change its ui elements accordingly to oh, to uh, enhance the user experience in in the end okay so in the end here we are focusing on improving the user experience and that is only the thing that is mattering okay so okay so what is adaptive layouts i hope you got this thing so it, it, it adapts according to the screen size and let's see what is a responsive versus adaptive so responsive versus adaptive here meaning of responsive is that you can see this is an example of responsive so here the elements are same but if the size is being changed here okay just the small elements is being shown small on the smaller screen and it becomes big on the bigger screen but what is meaning of adaptive so the adaptive means that the ui is changed accordingly to improve the user experience okay so that is the meaning of adaptive if you have any doubts make sure to drop them in the comments more examples let me just give a second here okay so let's take a look at example of use cases of ad adaptation so you can see when the when the app is changed from portrait mode to landscape uh, it should change its entire ui accordingly so that is an example of adaptation the layout adapting as i was talking here you know the screen size is changed the layout is entirely changed uh, previously uh, the the layout was like in a in a column now it is in a row okay
Okay, so uh, there again, there is again a concept called as canonical layouts in which uh, uh, there is, this is a style of uh, making adaptive layouts. So what you have to do in this one is like uh, when the layouts are uh, this is a type of adaptation. Okay, so again we, as we talk, so let's say this is a tablet and this is our application. So how it will convert from being this to this? So it will move its changes UI from in a list. So suppose this is a contact list. So how it will do is in, if it goes on a tablet. It will show the contacts here and after clicking on the contact it will show the details right here okay so that was about uh, the canonical layouts moving on to the breakpoints so what is meaning of breakpoints and what are the breakpoints in your android application so breakpoint basically means the size and the height and the width of your application okay so there is there are basically three uh, words that are used for different sizes of uh, the devices so there's first is compact devices compact devices means basically your your devices which are mobile phones which are uh, less than uh, like 6 inches of screen size then there comes like medium devices which are foldable devices or they can be tablet devices and then finally comes like expanded devices which are more like a monitor screen or something that are very big enough like a laptop screen okay so that was about the breakpoints uh, yeah talk is cheap so show me your code let's take a look at the code real fast so adding adaptability in your application to add adaptability you need to add this line in your build gradle file again you need to add implementation for material 3 ui and then getting the screen size uh, for the ui you can get, do it with using the calculative calculate window size class activity okay yeah that is how you'll do it and uh, finally rendering the different components according to screen size the question will come into your mind to make my application adaptive how am i going to render different components based on the screen size so first of all you'll calculate the screen size and well you use some logic here or you can get the direct classes that we've talked about that are compact medium and expanded and by using this classes there this is an uh, this is a condition here like if the if the window is compact then show this compact layout if the window is medium then show this medium layout and the, if the window is expanded then finally show this expanded layout okay so that's how it works uh, okay I, I think that was a bit fast but no problem i hope you got everything guys if you have any doubts i'm still in the comments for next five minutes I hope you got the video and thank you so much uh, for joining this session, okay? Thank you so much.